Today I'm sitting down with a guest here. I'm going to interview a NeoVim team member, TJ DeVries. Not only is he a NeoVim contributor, he also writes NeoVim plugins. He also is a YouTube content creator. He's got an excellent YouTube channel, so I thought I'd throw that out there. But of course, I don't want to introduce TJ. I, I want TJ to introduce himself. So TJ, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hey everybody. Uh... As mentioned, my name is TJ DeVries. Uh, I, I'm on the OVM core. I've been on the OVM core for a few years now, and I started contributing to NeoVim. Actually, my my first contribution, which maybe we'll talk about today, was all the way back in probably 2016, 2015, when I was uh, still in college. And it really changed uh, the way I thought a lot about software, which kept me sort of intrigued with the project for a long time. I've also made a couple pretty popular plugins like Telescope, which is a fuzzy finder for NeoVim. And uh, as mentioned, I like to make YouTube videos and I uh, stream on Twitch, which has been kind of wild and a different uh, experience. If you had asked me a few years ago if I thought I would be coding on Twitch live and people would want to watch, I would have laughed uh, very loudly. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's uh, that's it about me. Yeah, it does. It's that way especially as you get older, you'll be surprised how many twists and turns life takes. You'll end <laughs> up in places you never thought you'd end up with. How did you get into programming and, and development? Yeah, so that's kind of a funny story. I think uh, when I was in high school, I was always interested in sort of computers and I had done a lot of stuff just with a computer. I was definitely like the computer guy of the family and whatnot, but I didn't have anyone in my life that knew anything about programming, right? And so when I heard that there were programming languages, I always thought that to learn like a new language, it was like learning a foreign language. And I really didn't like my Spanish class. It was like memorizing yeah. stuff and all these things. I was like, I hate memorizing things. You know, I like math and like learning the rules and then using the rules to solve the things. Right. And so for a long time, I was pretty certain like, oh, computer programming, that's for like other people. And then uh, in college, I took a, a software course and as part of like my liberal arts education, I was like, oh my goodness. You know, I was like, <laughs> this is just problem solving. Uh, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> so I was a mechanical engineer before that. I was on track for mechanical engineer. But I switched to doing uh, computer engineering with a minor in, in computer science. And so ever since then, I've been I've been hooked, definitely. And uh, I, I, I've fallen in love with programming for sure. And people that are... Uh... People that are, are mathematical people mm -hmm. typically can handle programming. It, like it, it just makes sense. I was kind of that way early on too. Mm -hmm. All of my training, uh, as far as my college degrees and all, were in music. Which mm. music? There's a mathematical element to it. There's some physics behind it. Yeah. Uh, uh, and yeah, you know, programming just always kind of made sense to me at a young age too. Back in the early '90s, mid '90s, mm -hmm. especially once the web got started learning uh, you know html and then you know php and all of that stuff all the right. web languages it, it, it made total sense to me and i was the same way in high school i took <laughs> spanish and i hated it i, I didn't yeah. hate it i mean i passed the class right but if you ask me any spanish now yeah i, I couldn't tell you anything about it <laughs> where right. i still remember you know <laughs> some ancient code from 30 years ago mm -hmm. that um so you're now working on neovim you said you're one of the uh the core team members. Yep. When did you get started with that? So I I first heard about NeoVim actually pretty early in the project's history. I wasn't really involved in sort of like the genesis of NeoVim or anything. I uh, wouldn't have even known <laughs> how to <Right>. like build <laughs> a project or do anything with Git at the time, you know. But a coworker of mine was a, a Vim user at an internship that I went to and I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. Like, why does he do that? And we talked about it and he was really I just respected him a lot, like as a programmer. He taught me a lot of stuff and it was really exciting. And so I was like, OK, I'm kind of playing with this. And then another one of the interns was like, dude, there's this new thing called NeoVim and you can like write plugins in Python and do all this stuff because NeoVim has this right. remote plugin API. And I was like, what? Like this concept of writing code for my editor, right? Like writing code to write code. I always thought that that was cool. And lots of projects that I've worked on since have been related to that, that concept. So I was like, oh man, that's awesome. Let's like, let's check it out. You know? So we're, yeah. we're hacking away downstairs in the, in the intern's room, you know, like writing code to like make stuff easier for us to do our jobs. And, and then since then I was, I was hooked. And then actually 
during that summer, we were playing with like status line stuff. And I, and I wanted to center something on the sat status line. I was like, that seems like something you should be able to do without like writing a lot of code. There's already all these other things. Uh, but it wasn't possible at the time in NeoVim. So I, I it's, it's funny because it was just, I didn't like think about it at all. You know, I just like started writing some code and like, I didn't know what I was doing. I like had to Google how to right. do a GitHub pull request and all this stuff. And like I submitted something and it was very, it was just so like, you don't know what you don't know. And I, I was just shocked with all the stuff that I learned about, oh, like here's how you can write tests and here's how you can do a rebase for your PR and here's all these Git things, you know? And so the the NeoVim community in that PR was just like so helpful and kind and nice to me. And I had a bunch of people review and like by then we had like a hundred comments, you know, cause it was, fixing up some other things and writing more tests and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow, that was awesome. I learned yeah. so much from this one <laughs> tiny little experience. I want to keep being involved with this editor, you know? That's like, you know, I'm, I'm not much of a programmer. Typically all of my stuff, you know, when I run into trouble, Stack Overflow. I just look <laughs> up everything on Stack yeah. Overflow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you mentioned, uh, yeah, the extensibility of yeah. NeoVim. It is a different world once you realize, because... Most people have never encountered a piece of software that you can extend and make it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. you, basically, you build your editor. You program right. your own text editor to be whatever it is. Yep. And that level of customization, when you're first exposed to it, is mind-blowing. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I've sort of... I, I've somewhat coined this term that I've been working on called a personalized development environment, a PDE. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, as sort of this on the axis of text editor to IDE, right, which is where people always right. wonder, like, where do Vim or Emacs fit on those? And I've always found it kind of weird to put them in text editor. It's like, well, they, yeah. they do a lot more than edit text. You yeah. know what I mean? They like I, I've always, especially being mostly an Emacs user these yep. days, I hate it when people call Emacs a text editor because <laughs> yeah. that's like that's like 10 percent of what it does. Right. right. It's like. Yeah, so like much more Notepad <laughs> is a right. text editor. Yes. You know what I mean? And you're mm. like, it just doesn't. And the same thing for NeoVim and Emacs. And I put a lot of those into the yeah. same category where it's like, well, the point of it isn't. It's so that I can make it the way that I like and I can eliminate the little distractions in my day and the little annoyances. And I can make it a joy for me to program, you know, That's and it. so I so I totally I'm totally with you, like this customization, the extensibility you know, I've been calling it a PDE uh, for people, which is always sort of fun. Uh, it's funny you aspect. mentioned Notepad. Notepad was actually my text editor for everything for about 20 years. <laughs> the only thing I ever used wow. for anything, uh, programming, scripting, I used Notepad just because it was plain. Yep. It, it, there was nothing to it. And I just thought that was the way to go. I, I didn't like like graphical programming tools. Mm -hmm. I didn't like WYSIWYG kind of tools yep. because they always added extra code and crap. You know, yep. I was like, just give me notepad and, and that's all I needed. And I thought that way forever until yeah. I switched to Linux back yep. in 2008. And then I started getting into some of the editors on Linux. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, this is why nobody is using notepad anymore. <laughs> 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 These are so much better. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You can make Vim or Emacs or NeoVim feel like as notepad as you want and still be thousands of times better yeah. for sure. It's like, yeah, syntax highlighting. That's really neat. Why didn't yeah. I? <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, and now you, you know, yeah. now you're in love with color schemes, right? So it's right, like, exactly. you know, yeah. <laughs> that's really funny. Oh, I man, the notepad too. Yeah. I was using just black text on a white background. That, that probably is the reason my eyesight isn't as good. <laughs> 20 years of doing that, right? Yeah. So. That's funny. <laughs> so one of the things uh, for those that haven't used Vim or Neo Vim, because a lot of people that are going to watch this video are not that familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Many users actually, because I get this question all the time, they can't see a, a difference in Vim, Neo Vim. How do they differ? I mean, what is, how does Neo Vim differentiate itself from standard Vim? Yeah, I think there's, there's obviously sort of a, a wide array of things, but for the most important ones where NeoVim is more interesting to me as like a project to contribute to than Vim. Cause like, of course, Vim is awesome and lots of people contribute to it besides Bram, you know, it's not like 
you know, a lot of people think it's a one man show, but right. it's not right. Right. And it's not. And so it's, you know, so it's not nothing against uh, Vim, but like for me, the things for Neo Vim that are exciting was like the addition of an LSP client. Um, I was one of the people that worked a lot on that client and you can go dig up some old issues, you know, <laughs> college me writing up these essays. And about that's built LSP. in. Yeah, built it in is out of the in. box. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and, you know, at the time, I thought how you communicated with people online was the same way that you like submitted something to your professor, you know, so I'm writing these like long essays about why we should include LSP and stuff. And then the response would be like, seems good. Can you send a PR, you know, but it was, right. but, but, uh, but so an LSP client, I think really is important, especially now I use LSP for basically every language that I develop. And it lets me be really productive inside of NeoVim in ways that uh, I wasn't able to be before, I think. Um, okay. So that's one. I think the inclusion of TreeSitter for NeoVim, for those who don't know, TreeSitter is a library that allows people to really easily write grammars for particular languages, and it parses those into a tree. That's TreeSitter, right? Okay. And, uh, and what's cool about it is then basically like people write these for not just NeoVim. TreeSitter is a widely used platform. So improvements that TreeSitter gets, we sort of get to have for free inside of syntax highlighting and all this other stuff. But it enables things beyond just, just syntax highlighting. So one thing you could do is like incremental selection, uh, you know, where you sort of expand the selection of something. Well, you could do that with TreeSitter where you expand and you're sort of doing that semantically. Like I'm going to expand to this statement and then this expression and then this oh, function okay. and then this file, right? Instead of like, it just grows one line at a time. Right. And so there's a whole host of features that are really exciting there that I think especially work well inside of a modal editor, right? Where you could do something like move this function down mm. and it, it could understand like DAF would be delete around function. That's like a nice thing for a modal editor to be able to understand. And you can configure that by yourself and write additional queries and all this other stuff. But that like technology and that it's included inside of NeoVim as well, built in, um, is really exciting. And those kinds of ideas of uh, sort of combining and using these other technologies in a really interesting way makes it exciting to be inside of NeoVim. And that's like been NeoVim's focus for a while, this composition of other tools uh, that we don't have to do everything. So like Lua, like in your last video where you talked okay. about NeoVim, like the inclusion of Lua is another example of like composition of existing tools that work really great. Like Lua is fast and it's simple and it's super easy to embed. So we're like, well, that makes it a great choice yep. <laughs> as a scripting language. So let's use that. Um, so those those kinds of principles and ideas are the things that make it really exciting for me uh, inside of NeoVim. Yeah, and I think there's nothing wrong with VimScript, but the fact that everyone would have to learn VimScript, it's not something outside of Vim, you right. would never use VimScript. So you have to yep. learn a new language where when you pick a, an existing scripting language, then so many more people are going to already know the language anyway. You're going to right. get a lot more contributors, a lot more plugins. Mm -hmm. And additionally, like improvements to Lua in terms of like tooling or linters or like others, people write those because they're using Lua in their project, right? So that means you get to get those tools for free, right? Yeah, like you just reuse the code. All right. right. Yeah. And so there's a lot of like formatters that exist for Lua. Well, we didn't have to write them. That's nice that I didn't have <laughs> to write an auto formatter. We can just... <laughs> install the one and then run that on our projects. That's great. Um, so there's a lot of sort of things like that that are really exciting about composing tools, I think. And, and naturally, some of the questions, I'm sure you've heard it a million times, why Lua for the scripting language? Right. Yeah. How, how did they arrive at that particular language? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, I think, because there are a variety of scripting languages that have been in, embedded in different applications. I think for Lua, one thing that's really nice is like Lua 5.1, which is the Lua version that we have inside of NeoVim, is done. As in there's no like new things that can happen to the language. The language is fixed. So if you had something that could run in Lua 10 years ago, it can still run today. And you don't have to like learn any new language features or like the evolution of what's happening or anything like that, right? So there's no... 
no issue with breaking backwards compatibility or anything like that. So when Lua releases a new version, they're basically always major versions. So like even though they say 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, each one is effectively a new major version and they can break any compat that they want. So okay. in the Lua ecosystem, when you write something in 5.1, there's no expectation or thought, oh, you'll move that to 5.2. It's just like that's the code and it exists. Additionally, okay. by committing to 5.1, at least today, I'm not saying like, this isn't an official promise, then you, you know, whatever. But like <laughs> by using 5.1 today, we get the Lua JIT project. And Lua JIT is one of the most incredible pieces of software I've ever encountered. Um, it just makes Lua incredibly, incredibly fast. And so, so, so we get those things. So we get a really fast scripting language that's stable, which is great. You have an existing set of libraries. And beyond that, Lua is very simple which is good for what you want so that there's not a huge barrier for entry, right? When someone's just like, oh, I just want to write like one function. You know what right. I mean? It's yeah. not like, okay, time to get out the book to open the, <laughs> you know, like you got to read six hours. It's just yeah. like, oh, I just write the word function and I put like return in there and it works great. So, yeah. so there's that. Um, Cause I, and, we, yeah. we assume everybody's a nerd, but most people, when they configure things like NeoVim, yeah, they do really minor edits. They're right. they're not, you know. Again, they just want to write one simple function to do one simple task, and maybe that's all they ever add to that right. config file. And I think the like on ramp then is a lot easier, which allows people to sort of like just learn incrementally. I, I mean, the amount of people that have contributed to projects um, like of mine or in NeoVim Core has exploded with the ability to script in Lua because people just like could learn the basics, play around with some stuff. And then eventually they're like, well, oh, well, I could just write some code and get and help make this thing better. Right. So there's this like incremental learning when you have a really simple, stable language to build on top of um, is great. And then the last thing is just like Lua is incredibly easy to embed inside of a C based application. Like it just really does not take a lot of code. And there's very, very simple ways to move between Lua and C and to, you know, expose some C-based functions to Lua super easily, right? NeoVim is written in C. So uh, an example of that is NeoVim has a remote API. That's like when I was talking about you could connect to Python or things like that. Well, we expose all of those remote API endpoints in Lua with basically zero, as close to zero cost overhead as you can get by just basically exposing those C functions to Lua inside of a vim.api sort of like object. So you get all of these like super high performance, really fast. You can pass Lua closures into them and get them back out. This really beautiful integration that would be really, really hard to do in some other languages that aren't so easy to embed uh, inside of C. Nice. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly... I've never experienced any kind of performance issues with NeoVim. Yep. I know some people, I'm not one of those people that have like a massive, massive config file with a lot right. of plugins. I'm I'm assuming if I had like a hundred different plugins, things would change a little bit as far as a, a speed difference, but I've, I've never noticed it, but typically. Yeah, I, I mean, I have, I have a lot of plugins uh, cause like I use NeoVim for every language and I've like written when a lot of plugins. A, so like when you say a lot, how many plugins do you have installed? Probably like I mean I I haven't counted in a long time, but it wouldn't mm -hmm. surprise me if it's like more than 50. Oh, um, oh, okay. And and I there's there's a lot of ways you can like make your startup faster, but for me my startup is like 300 milliseconds or less usually. Yeah. So like I I don't I don't find a lot of uh <laughs> that, well. that's quick. You know. I, you'll you'll find people in the community though that complain about software oh. that I, I've seen people complain that something started in like 1.2 seconds. Ugh. Yeah. I was like, dude, it's a second. Yeah. One so, second. Like. So I know people who, you know, they lazy load and do all this other right. stuff, which is fine. And that's fun for them. And that's great. Uh, and they get theirs down to even when they've got a lot of plugins to like 50 milliseconds or whatever. So like the startup time's good. And I, I personally feel that NeoVim is like very snappy for me when I like watch some other editors just like how they respond to things i'm like oh it kind of like hurts because it takes like a lot longer so i think a lot of like lua is just really 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 fast um just as like an example 
we've made some improvements to telescope, but when we were first making telescope, it was just all, which is a fuzzy finder for Neovim, right? It's mm -hmm. just all Lua, all single thread, all in the main process. And we could filter and sort and like fuzzy find over thousands of items without ever blocking the editor, basically, which always like blew my mind. Cause I'm like, how is this happening? We're running basically like a little algorithm over thousands and thousands of strings to match against this text. And it's happening like as I'm typing and it never feels like it uh, blocks for some reasonable amount. So it just, I think Lua is just incredibly fast at a lot of these things, um, which unlocks the ability to use um, some more plugins than maybe you would have wanted to back in like VimScript days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you keep mentioning your your telescope program, which I, yep. I also brought up early in the interview, but we yep. didn't really explore that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly telescope is? Yeah, the it, it started off as a project that we were sort of just exploring on my Twitch stream where I'd used FZF for a long time and I really like FZF and it's just like also an incredible piece of software that's just like beautiful and always works and you never have any problems with it. And it's like, wow. This thing is just really solid. But the the problem that I had with it was it was a little bit difficult to do stuff with it inside of NeoVim. I was looking for like more, more customizability, more, more like a really easy API that I could use to compose different things together. So we just started exploring like, what would it look like if we made a fuzzy finder that was specifically for NeoVim and using a lot of the new tools and APIs that we have in new NeoVim versions, you know, floating windows or mm -hmm. using different highlighting things that are um, more powerful that you can do over different ranges. And so we started exploring that idea with a focus on being able to customize basically every aspect of it in a very Vim way, you know, like, oh, you get to reuse your color scheme. That's great. That means the preview window that you get is exactly the same color scheme as when you open the file, you know, which was exciting and it was cool because before you might preview uh like if you're searching over some files right and it shows a preview on the right side in fcf it just picks some color scheme that you tell fcf to preview it with right maybe it's like uh, colored okay. by like bat or cat or something like that does, right does the preview window does it uh does it do syntax highlighting when it does the preview or is it just a plain um in fcf it's possible to use like some external program to syntax highlight it okay. but it wasn't the same color not, so not like, that you necessarily need it right. i was just i was wondering yep. that'd be kind of neat for the preview yep. too right right but so then for telescope it literally is just a neovim buffer in the floating window for the preview and so it highlights it exactly the same syntax highlight and everything as if you were to open the file in neovim okay um so, so we just sort of explored that idea and tried to explore like, okay, how easy could we make it to like filter over just a list of items? Like, can we make that, you know, just like three lines of code so that you can write your own little filter scripts for things that are interesting to you, right? And like compose all these things together. So that's, that's kind of how it started and sort of like the ethos of, of Telescope. Very cool. Very cool. You've got any other uh, plug-in projects, you know, personal projects? Other than telescope, or is that the main one you you're focused on? Yeah, that's that's the main the main one outside of like improvements to NeoVim core that mm -hmm. I've done. I have sort of a smattering of other smaller plugins that are mostly like I just happen to make them plugins because I wrote them for myself. Like, oh, I made a status line plugin, but it's just because I was making a status line for myself and it was fun, you know, or things like that. They're not, not as uh, yeah, not necessarily for public consumption. Is that yeah, right? right. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I say I'm, you know, I'm making this. Uh, you guys can see this, and it's okay, but I, I'm not going to make any guarantees about about no, what we're going <laughs> to. It, it doesn't it, matter yeah. if you you put it on your your GitHub yep. or your GitLab, and you, you you put a warning on it saying, "I know this is broken. Don't use it." They'll still they'll still clone that repository. Yep. They'll try to use it. And stuff. Yep, <laughs> which is okay. You know that's that happens, and uh, and it's uh, fun. But it's nice for them to know that uh, I can say, like, "Look, I told you that it might not work, and I, I was told right." You so. <laughs> you <know? laughs> uh, thanks for verifying what yeah, I already right. told you first. So. <laughs> And one of the things with me, getting back to when I first discovered Vim, yeah. because Vim was the first, I would say, truly extensible text editor mm. I ever tried. And I first switched to Vim probably about five years ago or so. And I remember 
when I started learning the Vim key bindings, because that's always, mm -hmm. you, you assume that's hard, right? Mm -hmm. Well, within a couple of weeks, it just, everything seemed natural. I was like, people make it out to be so much more difficult yeah. to learn the modes and the bindings than it really is within a couple of weeks if you spend some time in it. Mm -hmm. uh, not only do you know it, you can't live without it. And that was one of the things that once I learned the Vim bindings, it was difficult for me to use other software that didn't use the Vim bindings. I don't, I sent you an email a minute ago. Yeah. And I wanted to do a colon Q to quit out of my email, right? <laughs> I, I hit I to get yeah. into insert mode. I'm like, yeah. no, that's not the way my email right. client works. Yeah. Right? When I'm gaming and I see people type GG for good game, I'm thinking they're trying to go to the first line of the document for some reason. Like, it, my, my brain is wired in a different way now. Have you yeah. experienced that? Yeah, I've, I've experienced really similar things too. I think people really, obviously, so we'll take a step back. I don't know that you can say using Vim is intuitive without reading anything about it, right? Like, because what happens is you open up Vim and you're confused and that's oh, like a reasonable yeah. thing to have. You know what I'm saying? You need but the then, tutor. Right. right. Yep, you need to do Vim tutor. Yeah. But then it's like, after you do that and you sort of understand like why they were trying to do some of those things, then you're thinking, oh, like I get it. And then like it, the pieces really start coming into play. And I, I usually tell people, you know, if you used Vim or like a Vim mode in your editor for a week or two weeks and you really committed yourself to not cheat during that time, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, you're not just going to start using arrow keys and the same shortcuts I was using before. You'll be able to move around as fast as you were like before that. And I think it'll be like a lot more comfortable. And I kind of think that it's like fun. And then after that, it's only upside because you start thinking about, oh, I want to delete inside these parentheses. So you're like, okay, well, I know D is delete. And I said inside. So I use I and then I type a parenthesis and then it deletes inside the parenthesis. You're like, oh, that was great. I like that my brain can just sort of think about what it wants to do. And my hands will just like naturally follow. And I notice myself a lot of times, <laughs> like I have a hard time writing in, you know, Slack or something like that right. for work. And I'm like, oh, oh, I, uh, I can't do yeah. that thing. Like, you know, I wanted to keep hitting I all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yep, <laughs> exactly. Or like I hit escape, you uh -huh. know, a few times when I'm done typing something, I'm like, oh, right. I don't have to, to do that. I'm, I'm on a GitHub issue or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think for me, the moment I realized I would never go back to like plain text editors like yep. Notepad, for example, mm -hmm. was when I needed to edit a file, maybe hundreds of lines or even thousands of lines, mm -hmm. and I needed to do something repetitive. Yeah. And I discovered macros. Yeah. And I realized I could change thousands of lines within seconds mm -hmm. where it would have taken me days, if not weeks to do that. <laughs> right. Idea, right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, I love I love macros. We always make a joke on stream, though, when I like start recording a macro that now we're under like macro pressure, you know, and so you yeah. always feel like you're going to make a mistake when you're on stream doing it live. You're like, oh, I've typed this a thousand times, but I'm going to mess it up. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, because all of my videos, I always end up in a text editor in my videos and typically yep. I'm using either Neo Vim or if I'm in Emacs, I'm using Evil Mo, which is the right. Vim bindings. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do a macro and they'll see yep. me. And I'll get comments. Well, you could have done this to make that macro. Yeah, they're they're always going to improve yeah, on it. Right. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, I I didn't sit here and think about it. I just right. was doing it. Right. But mm -hmm. you're going to have people in the comments that are going to, man, you could have done that like mm -hmm. twice as fast. Yeah. Which which is uh, which is like fun to learn, but also part of the thing that like I tell people too when they're thinking about learning is like, um, you know, it's okay especially for like macros or like search and replace, you don't always have to find like the perfectly optimal one. You can just write the one that got the job done for you in oh, five yes. seconds, instead of taking three minutes to figure out what the right search and replace is. You're like, I'm already done. You know, that's okay. Uh, or I'll, I'll sometimes record videos where I decide I'm going to write a script to do something from scratch yep. right yep. here on, on camera. Yep. And I'll get people trying to refactor the code or what, which is cool. But I yeah. was like, hey, I had a problem. I was going to show you how to solve it on camera. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's there's definitely that balance. Um, and it's a balance that I think you have to strike if you're using, you know, Vim, NeoVim, Emacs, a bunch of these editors is you, you sometimes got to draw the line of when you're saying, I'm going to stop customizing for today and I'm going right. to get some of my real work done. And that's, oh, yes. you know. 
that's a personal thing that everyone has to decide and learn for themselves uh, to do. Because a lot of people that don't spend a lot of time customizing and configuring their software, mm -hmm. whether it be their text editors, their window managers, whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be, they look at those people that do spend all that time configuring their software mm -hmm. and it's wasting time. I've actually yep. been accused of that. You spend more time configuring your software than actually using it. Yeah. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's part of the thing, you know, going back to that idea of like a personalized development environment sort of thing. One of the pitches that I have for that as a concept is some people find that aspect of customizing fun. And it's a yeah. way that you can learn a lot of new things, not it just is. about like your editor, but working on things like me for plugins has allowed me to have one myself as a user, right? Cause like I consume my plugins. So I'm like, Oh, like that's not very good. That was annoying to solve that. And so I have to think about how can I fix that API? How can I make it better? But I also have a bunch of users then who tell me how things could be better or improvements or people who submit new ideas to that. And each time I do that, if I'm paying attention and if I'm being, you know, intentional about it is an opportunity for me to learn and practice how to be a better software developer overall, you know? And so it, it's true that maybe I'm not shipping a new product when I'm working on telescope, right? Like I'm not making any money off telescope. Right. I was like, okay, sure. Yes, I, I understand. But I am getting practice at becoming a better software developer. Yeah. A, a matter of fact, I would say configuring your software is an educational experience. For yeah. everyone, regardless mm -hmm. if you're a developer or, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, if you spend real time configuring NeoVim, for example, mm -hmm. you're going to learn a lot more, not only about NeoVim, but mm -hmm. about Lua and right. maybe about the core operating system for if you're running Linux. Do you run Linux as your operating system? We didn't yep. discuss that. Yeah. Because obviously NeoVim is cross-platform. Yep. Okay. Uh, do you ever run Windows or Mac or you're strictly a Linux user? Or do I do have multiple all machines? of my like dev on uh, Linux. I use Pop! OS. I have okay. a cool System76 computer that I'm in love nice. with. So, yeah. <laughs> Which System76 machine did you get? I got one of the Thelio, I think Mira, if I recall correctly. So it was oh, cool. flawless box for me like i've never had to fix anything which is why i wanted that so i think they're doing great in that uh in that space of making it easy for people to just like buy a computer and it starts running and i've actually done two whole linux major version upgrades since i've gotten it and they worked both times i was shocked <laughs> i was absolutely uh -huh. shocked <laughs> Up upgrading from one major version of a linux distribution to the next mm -hmm. These days, they tend to go. They do tend to go well. well. Yeah. yeah, I've had some problems in the past with like GPU drivers and stuff and whatnot. But, yeah. but it's that's a that's a story for a different day probably. Yeah. But it's like, it was uh, it was great. So so I do all of my dev on that. I have some other stuff for like my streaming equipment and things that's not on Linux. But that's just so that I can spend time streaming and not fixing my camera. <laughs> right. Now, what are some of the the plugins that you use in NeoVim as far as just, just a few that you can't live without? Because yeah. I, th I think a lot of people are interested in, in that sort of thing as well. Yeah, what totally. do you think are some of the best plugins out there in the, the ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, the one that's not technically a plugin, but like learning to use the built-in LSP, I think is a really big game changer for using NeoVim. I mean, a lot of the LSPs are continually getting lots of new you know, improvements and development spent on them. And you just get to reap those rewards for free once you understand how that works. And for me, it's great to have the same key binds and all the things uh, for every language, you know, because I, I work in quite a few different languages um, at work. So I have to jump between a lot of different stuff. So it's great to just be like, oh, I don't have to switch between, you know, JetBrains X and VS Code Y and do all this, right? Um, so that so that's the, that's the first one that I recommend if people are thinking about, oh, I want to use NeoVim seriously i would say you should you should think about learning how to use the lsp and it's not super complicated i think it's it's relatively uh straightforward to to get going on that um another one i mean of course like i use telescope well wow, surprise you know but uh uh so we don't have to talk a lot about that because we've we've talked quite a bit um and you've got uh, videos about telescope I do. as well i do so. have some videos about it yep no. um yeah hashtag ad you know but uh i do have some videos about that 
And I think I think it's it, you don't have to use telescope, but I would recommend using a fuzzy finder. There are various FZF plugins or other things like that. And I think they work really well in the context of like a modal editor. Um, I have a lot of different key binds for different things that I regularly do. So I have a key bind to really quickly search for symbols in my workspace. Right. And that uses a combination of LSP and telescope so that I can filter all of those symbols. Um, as I'm typing, which allows me to navigate between a project just super quickly and easily, right? Or like, nice, yeah. I, I have a different key bind than to navigate just within one document, right? So what a file I'm looking at, I can quickly do that. So, you know, c combining those things is really exciting. There are um, quite a few plugins that build off the tree sitter capabilities of NeoVim that I think are great. There's ones like tree sitter that use, that create new text objects. So that's like a text object in Vim or NeoVim is basically like a way that the editor considers a group of text. So like W is word, right? And so you move across a word. Um, but NeoVim tree sitter has this way to then say like, what's a function or what's a parameter or what's a list or what's an element. And then you can add new key binds for each of those, which is really exciting because when you're doing, so, yeah, go ahead. Would tree sitter, you're talking about a, like a function. Would it be able to pick out like a, a parameter for a variable, things like that? Would it be able to, to slice it up however you want or are you just getting the whole function? Yeah, you can write um, additional queries to sort of provide your own text objects, which is really fun. One that I, I like a lot is that builds on top of the text objects is actually called uh, swap. It's part of this large sort of tree sitter extension. And it lets you do things like if you're inside of a parameter list, you can basically say swap this one forward or backwards, oh, right? So if you're cool. refactoring something, it'll take the text, it'll take the um, you know the type hint if there is for your language, like all that stuff, and it'll just swap places. And it doesn't matter. The thing that's cool about it, right, is since it's operating on a basically a syntax tree, it, it doesn't matter if they're on different lines or they're in different spots or whatever, or if like you're passing an argument to a function and that argument is like a another function right like if it's some like lambda in line it will move the whole lambda like to the previous spot or things like that so so this sort of idea and of course you know i i know i'm talking to an emacs user so like of course structural editing like obviously right. doesn't everybody have structural <laughs> editing well not for other languages besides lisp okay not you know right um but this is sort of a general purpose way that you could do that in a lot of ways so so for me those are probably like the top three that i'm really like in love with and like i said i think it doesn't have to be telescope i think any fuzzy finder is just sort of like a must-have for uh your vim or neovim experience yeah it's interesting you mentioned languages too i, I have noticed that certain language communities mm -hmm. gravitate to certain editors yeah have you noticed that with, with neovim what, what do you think as far as languages as development communities which ones do you think are the biggest representation of the people that use NeoVim? Yeah, that's an interesting question because... Because it's easy for me to tell you, like Emacs, obviously, the Lisp guys, any of the Lisp variant right. scheme, yep. uh, Haskell, which you know, I, I do a lot with Haskell. Mm -hmm. The Haskell community loves Emacs. Yeah. Um, but NeoVim, obviously, Lua, I would think yep. would be a big target. Right, um, yeah. Py Python would probably yep. be another one. I see um, quite a few... People for me, it's a little difficult because like I see a lot of people that like I I know. So so I mm -hmm. don't want to, you know, over index too much, right. on, you know, people <laughs> that I know. But I see quite a few people um, in the like Rust community. Mm -hmm. They like NeoVim because Rust Analyzer, the LSP is really good. Okay. Um, and so then that allows you to have this really nice, quick editor experience. It's combined with a bunch of other tools. Um I think Go as well is a pretty popular uh, one because Go also has a pretty good LSP. And I think it fits kind of with the ethos of Go, right? That like less is more, uh, that kind of like Rob Pike uh, sort of founding mentality for when they created Go. And I think NeoVim fits is well. It, is that. it like a, a minimalist kind of mentality you think that, that makes yeah. it a good Yeah, I think fit? like for Go, it's just like you want you want simple things to be able to accomplish the task, right? So right. 
And and so I think Neovim fits with that. And Go, please, is pretty good. And like a lot of the stuff for Go works very well from running from the command line. So people tend to be closer to that. But I don't know if I have a really great overview of of everybody yeah. who's out there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, typically, how I get that is yeah. sometimes you go to specific language communities, mm. certain subreddits for a particular language, and you'll see like, all of them are using the same yeah. know, text editor <laughs> IDE. Yeah. And it's like, well, why did they choose that one? Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, we need a study done on that. We do. Day, right? We do need a study. That would be fun <laughs> to find out. Broken down by a few uh, you know, languages and stuff would be fun to see. And I, I mentioned that you have a YouTube channel. And yep. I, I actually have checked out some of your videos. Oh, and nice. One of the things that I noticed on your channel is you get a nice amount of views. <laughs> like oh, you, have, thank you. you have a nice community built around your channel. So tell the uh, my audience a little bit more about what you do on your YouTube channel, some of your goals, what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think for for my goals, there's sort of two different things that I've been doing. One is definitely like I, I post stuff about NeoVim, cool new features or tutorials or um, sort of information how to use a plugin or like a deep dive into a plugin and stuff because I think uh, some people really like to learn from videos and so that's a really fun way to do that and I also like getting to explore those things and then the other you, yeah, I was going to say uh, do you find that by doing the videos you learn as well oh yeah definitely right. we had a series that I'll hopefully pick up again soon called take Tuesday so it's kind of a joke about like take two take a second look at something mm -hmm. you know and we would stream the exploration of the plugin and I would just learn like a ton of stuff. So one of them was this really great snippets plugin called Lua Sniff, and it lets you create really cool and interesting snippets in Lua. So one of the ones that we explored making was one that like examines the AST of a Go function and will return all the default values for you. Like it'll generate a snippet that has the mm -hmm. default values, which was really cool because, you know, you end up doing that a lot in Go. So I learned a ton from doing that. And it's a really fun series uh, for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, matter of fact, I would say if you want to learn anything, it doesn't matter the topic. Yep. Become a teacher, teach somebody yep. else. You will learn more than the student. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they'll learn. ask you questions that you yeah. never thought of. Like, <laughs> oh, I really didn't understand how that worked. I like need to go do the work to figure that out. So mm -hmm. That's really fun. And then kind of like the second thing is uh, I'm working more towards making some just videos generally about my thoughts on different aspects of software. Like I made a video talking about what what is a personalized development environment? Why do I call that a thing? I, I want to make some about, you know, like you know, just random stuff that I think of that I see a lot of people maybe confused that hopefully we can help them like along their path of learning to become better software developers. Uh, you mentioned uh, you're using Pop! OS right now. Yep. Uh, how long have you used Linux? I've used Linux uh, since college, basically. I, I've basically only done development ever on Linux. So for probably about seven-ish years or so. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to use Linux in college. That's also nice. Too, so. We had a we had a computer lab for our CS that was all all Linux boxes, which was great. It was a very, very cool experience. That was my first. That was my first introduction to it. I'd never even heard of it, you know, before taking yeah. classes. So yeah, and that that would be scary if all you got was a Windows environment. To, yes, it's like you know, you're not prepared for anything. Right. Way. Yes, it was. <laughs> it was good. They tried to make sure we learned uh, what real life in software dev was like, which was great. Right. So seven years is, a, is actually a long time for yeah. for Linux. So you've seen Linux before Steam and yeah. back when Linux was really tough sometimes to, <laughs> yeah. to deal with. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, cool. it's been really exciting for me to just see how a lot of it's transformed. I mean, I'm not willing to say this is the year of the Linux, the Linux desktop, desktop, of course. <laughs> I'm not willing to say that on camera, but, uh. Uh, but we're getting closer, I think, at least. I think we're getting closer. <laughs> I think we're exactly where we need to be. Yeah. To be honest, I, mm -hmm. Linux is never going away. So. Right. And I, I mean, it works for me and there's a lot of other people that it works for. So that seems great. It doesn't have to be for everybody's thing. Uh, that's part of the fun of the world that we're all different people and we can like different stuff. But getting back to NeoVim for a yep. second, where, where do you see the future of NeoVim? Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting possibilities for NeoVim's future as it uh, continues to go on. Things that I I know other people on the core team and I would like to see happen is NeoVim's ability to be embedded 
in other places to be improved. Um, so there's some really awesome projects that do that already. There's a project called VS Code NeoVim that literally like has a NeoVim instance running and it will, so when you like type a command, it can actually run that in the NeoVim and then sync the results back. So, you know, it works for every Vim regex because it actually uses NeoVim. It's actually know? NeoVim running right. in VS Code. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's excitement there. But beyond that as well, uh, one of the long-term goals for NeoVim uh, from its start, and that's still like on the horizon of things that we think about when we make changes and when we work, is creating basically like a Vim library. Uh, as in like NeoVim is able to be compiled into this, into a state that you could like embed it as a library, like a linked library inside of your thing. And so you could pass some editor state and then some like command or motion or whatever, and it could return to you a new editor state, which would be really awesome because then we could stop having everyone have to write their own 75% baked you know vim mode for their editor that's where they, i was about to i was about to ask you that because vim emulation yeah is horrible and almost every editor i've ever tried it in right so so i think so that would be like a really exciting thing for me to see happen um as well and i think that would in a lot of ways sort of like guarantee neovim has a long life right because mm -hmm. it, and if they're the go-to place for entity vim you know, we'd say emulation is not really so much emulation right. anymore, but like still a Vim mode for your mm -hmm. editor um, that has a really long shelf life, I think, uh, for NeoVim. And there's also lots of other exciting things happening in terms of like GUIs for NeoVim and more extensibility and, you know, all, all these kinds of things. Um, but those those two goals are really like exciting for me. And they allow us also in general, I think when you write code that's made to do those kinds of things to be a library or to be embedded you end up with like a lot cleaner code base that allows you to unlock new things that you didn't see possible before you're like oh we could just like make it so that you could have direct access to this that we never thought you could do before and it unlocks a whole new class of plugins that no one no one had ever thought of you know like tree sitter is an example right where we like we're able to then put tree sitter inside of neovim and now you have this way to query the structure of any file. Whoa, that unlocks new possibilities that no one was even that wasn't on anybody's radar five years ago. Yeah, that that sounds very powerful. Yeah. Well, uh, that that was really. I think I've asked all the questions about NeoVim I had. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you, do you have any final thoughts? Anything you, you want to throw out there? Anything I didn't ask you about that you wanted to get in about NeoVim? No, I think uh, people should just give it a try. You yeah. know, I mean, obviously a little selfishly, but I think there's <laughs> there's some cool projects. Um, I can send you a link later, a project called kickstart.envim. That's like a starter config that people yeah. can. Uh, it's not a framework. It's just something you copy and paste as a way that you can basically get started. And, you know, it tries to set up some simple LSP and auto completion and some stuff like that, um, which that's I great. Think which it just like lets you at least see, am I interested in this, right? Is this a thing that I would want to try? Uh, because you never the, know. Sometimes yeah. you, you might li like it. So, yeah. Because one of the things I get, and I'm sure you get this too, <laughs> um, is I'll, I'll get people asking me about NeoVim and other software too. Right. But, hey, how do I get this plugin installed? How do I, <laughs> you know, and, and half the time, or I'd say 95% of the time, it's a plugin I've never used. I don't have a use case for, so of course right. I did. But you know, they're asking me to try it out. It'd be great if we we had somewhere to direct these people. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And so, like, Kickstart is a project that I've helped with and help maintain now. That is just like a way that you could exactly what it says: kickstart your right. NeoVim experience, and then it's got a place where you can put in new plugins. You know, you're gonna have to go read the README. Yeah, you're gonna have to understand how this thing works. Yeah, of course. But like. For me, that's part of the fun, right? Learning new ideas, seeing different people's perspective. That's that's good. And it's not for everybody, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. you, you you will have to read the manual. Yes. All right. That that friendly manual, <laughs> as I like to say, RTFM means read right. the friendly manual. So <laughs> Well, uh, anything worth doing does have a cost. So Yep, agreed. Well, uh, would you like to disclose any contact information? Where can people follow you on the internet? You got any social media links? Obviously, plug your YouTube channel as well, your yeah. Twitch channel. So on YouTube, I'm TJ DeVries, and basically everywhere else, you can find me at 
Tej DV. So that's T E E J underscore DV. So that's my Twitter and Twitch, which are the other places that you can uh, hang out. I like to post what I think are pretty funny uh, programming memes on Twitter. So if you're into that, you know, you can always, you can always uh, follow me there. <laughs> Very nice. And uh, I'll try to link to all of your, your accounts Please. in the show description as well. Perfect. Well, thank you for hanging out with me, TJ, and talking a little bit about NeoVim and some of your personal projects and just about software, programming, Linux, computing yeah. in general. Yeah, very <laughs> it's cool. It's been my pleasure. Yeah, right. thank you for having me. All right, and best of luck to you and all of your endeavors. Thank you. All right. Peace.